Yeah. So I was uh, invited to a place for Shabbos, and basically I would, the plan is to meet up at the light rail station near Machne Huda. Obviously, I don't want to take my Rav Cub there, and I also don't want to walk, so would it be okay if I was to quickly hop on the light rail, skin my car, and get off like in the morning? Or is there an issue with that? I'm, 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 I'm not following. I want to make sure I pay. But I also oh, I see. Now, now, now they, so you want to pay twice in the morning. Pay once, but not take the ride. Like right, right. I understand that. Yeah, uh, yeah that, 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 that'd be fine. The only question is, I think the way the system works is you can't really double charge. If you're, if you're within 90 minutes, it, it doesn't register. So is that, isn't that right? Uh, I'm not saying double charge. I'm saying... Oh, oh just, just to use it and don't go on, you mean? Yeah, don't, don't get yeah. written on it. Yeah, that's perfectly fine, because who cares? As long as they're getting the money... Uh, and you didn't benefit beyond uh, the trips that you paid for. So I think that's going to be fine. That's a smart idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I have a question. Is Shome Nigia, is it Daraisa or Darabonon? And if it's Darabonon, why did the rabbis enact it? Right. So this is uh, an interesting question. Uh, the ideas of Nigia, uh, hugging, kissing, affectionate contact with the other, with the other sex, if you're not married, mm -hmm. is that a Torah prohibition or is that a rabbinic prohibition? So in point of fact, it's a big machlokas rishonim, as a matter of fact. Uh, the Rambam, Maimonides, the Rambam actually poskins that the Easter of what is called, now this is not pure Nagia, I'll get to that, but Nagia Shalchiba, which means affectionate touching, hugging, kissing, hand-holding, uh, the Rambam says it's an Isra de Arisa. Now you may ask, well, where does the Torah say that's prohibited? Because normally by all the Arias, it only talks about sexual relations. Don't have sexual relations with them. But the answer is by Nida, it says, uh, El Eishas Nida Leisikrav, don't even draw near. So the Rambam understands that that refers to Chibuk, hugging, kissing, what is called Nagia Shel Chiba. And since Nida is one of the forbidden Arayos, uh, this is an issue that applies to all everything that is arayos. The Ramban, on the other hand, argues with the Rambam, and the Ramban says the word leisikrav by nida also refers to intercourse. Del raisa, you can hug and kiss, you know, an, another woman, no problem. But rabbinically, it is prohibited. And the reason they prohibited it was very simple. Uh, it's a typical Gezerah formulation. Thou shalt not hug lest you come to have intercourse because you get sexually aroused. Right, so that's a big machlokis, the Rambam and the Ramban. Now, huh? and, and the with, with a non-Jew or, or? Are you talking about can a Jew uh, have Nagia with a, with a non-Jewish woman? No, that, that's called Arias as well. Uh, we treat uh, a non-Jewish uh, woman as, as an Arab. Generally, some of the they use the example of the Nida as an example. Yeah. Like, and it's not a Nida? No, no. So, so, according to the Rambam, Nida is an example of an Erva. So, anything that's an Erva has the issue of Lysik River. That's what the Rambam says, yeah. But the Ramban learns it's Lagamri Mid Rabbanan. Now, of course, you still have to keep the Rabbanans. Now, keep in mind, though, here's something else that's important to talk about, and that is. The Machlokas, the Rambam, and the Ramban is only the category of Nagia that is called Nagia Shel Chiba, affectionate touching, which means theoretically touching that's not affectionate is, is Vadai not Usher de Arisa, maybe Usher de Rabbanan, uh, and that gives rise to the big Shaila of shaking hands in the workplace. Let me explain what the issue is. Shaking hands in the workplace is not necessarily sexual, it's business. So as you know, although the mainstream position in the Torah world is that this is improper, it's important to know that, and Rav Moshe Feinstein uh, also poskins that it's improper, there were Rabbanim, particularly in Germany and presently in the United States, that are makil, particularly if the woman stuck out her hand first. So I just want you to understand the basis for this. The basis for this is that shaking hands in a business relationship is not called Nagia Shel Chiba. And as a result, there are some opinions that Matir Nagia 
that's not Shalchiba, and even those who aser Nigia, that's not Shalchiba Midrabanan, but if it's only an Isra Durabanan, it will be pushed aside for covered Abrios, not to embarrass somebody. That's the Gemara in Brachos, that Isuri Durabanan are set aside for covered Abrios, and the concept would be that not to uh, respond to someone who puts out their hand is an insult to them, covered Abrios. Right? So that would be the Svara for it. But the svara on the other side is that nigia shel chiba doesn't have to be sexual. Uh, even shaking hands is expressive of affection, and that's enough to characterize it as nigia shel chiba. And once you have that characterization, even covered abrios is not going to help you because, according to the Rambam, at least, you're dealing with an iser diorisa, and an iser diorisa cannot be set aside even for covered abrius. So that's kind of what's going on. Now, you may ask the following question. Um, is a man allowed to be a gynecologist where he's physically touching uh, women and the like, or physical therapists, many, many types of professions? So like the idea that this is not Nagia Shalchiba and that would be much or so that would be fine, but the Rishayim say, even if you take the position that Nigiya She'eno Shalchiba is Asr Mid Rabbanan. Here, the Rabbanan didn't make their Gezeira in the context of professional activity on the grounds that a professional is not going to wa- want to ruin their reputation uh, by crossing boundaries and the like. Now, whether that's true today or not, you know, it's going to be an interesting question. Unfortunately, the Yetzir Horus have, go- have gone up. On the other hand, you know, you have the Me Too movement. In other words, it cuts both ways in a sense. In a sense, as the generation has become more and more and more precious, on the other hand, uh, it's harder to get away with things a little bit. So in a sense, there may be new boundaries uh, that might allow Nigiya she'eno shalchiba. Yeah. <clears throat> so Gemara, Brachos, Daf, Nun, Gimel, Amud, Beis, the Misa of Rabbi Barbarchana, who he was in a caravan and he needed to return to the spot that he ate to make a bracha, but he didn't want to. He thought to himself, if I claim that I need to make a bracha back there and I tell this whole caravan to turn around, they're going to tell me that, oh, you're, you're, you're praying to Hashem. Isn't Hashem everywhere? Why can't you just do it here instead of there? Right, right. So but my question is, why do we have to return to this place that we ate? Um, if that is technically true, that like Hashem is always Bishamayim, you know, and... You know, right, right, my, right. My so that, right. So that's a good question. Everyone knows the basic halacha that uh, you are mechuyev to bench in the place where you ate. Uh, yes, but the eved, uh, if you forgot and you're on a bus already, we, you, know, you can bench wherever you are, but lechatchila is a davar pashut, that uh, you're not supposed to leave until you bench, and even if you left, you're supposed to try to go back and bench uh, when it's possible, at least for birkat hamazon and at least for alamichia. Barina fashos, you're not mechuyev to. Uh, go back uh, for that. So the question becomes, uh, you know, you quoted a Gemara where people would say to a rabbi, oh, isn't God everywhere? Why do you have to bench? Re- is he only where you ate? So the question you're asking is a very good question. Why isn't that a good argument? That's <laughs> a pretty good argument. Hey, God is here. God is everywhere. Why do you have to go back uh, to where you ate? So part of the idea is that uh, this is the, w- what is Birkat Hamazan about? Birkat Hamazon is about expressing gratitude, expressing thank you. And therefore, there is this notion that you're not supposed to leave until you've completed your job. Meaning to say, to simply say, you know, when I leave, that means I'm going on to a new activity. And then, if I thank God after I'm doing something else, it's as if it becomes an afterthought. Oh, yeah, I forgot to to, to do that. And you have to look at it the other way around. This is your primary responsibility before you do anything else, including leaving. Now, you may say, well, maybe that's a good answer why you're not allowed to leave. But maybe that's not a good answer. Why do I have to go back once I did leave? As I understand, for me to leave before I say thank you is rude to Hashem. But if I already left, like, what's mechai of me to go back? That, that's a very good point. Uh, but it could very well be, it could very well be, I'm thinking out loud, that the chiv to go back is to kind of 
make sure you're not going to leave. Mean, meaning, if the pshat is, once I left, I don't have to go back, then I may not have an incentive to stay. I may decide I'll just leave. But if the halacha is that even if I leave, I have to go back, that takes away any incentive I would have to leave. So it's a, it's a kind of way of forcing me to stay put because I'm not going to gain by anything. By the way, this idea is the same basic idea behind the rules that before you dive in chakras in the morning, you're not supposed to eat, you're not supposed to do a lot of activities other than learning or, or the like, because the very first part of your day has to be to thank Hashem. And you don't like relegate, you know, you make a list of things. I got to do five things today. You don't put serving Hashem like number two or number three. It's got to be, it really got to be number one. Of course, that raises a lot of interesting questions. It wasn't your question, but just uh, to digress. Uh, one of the questions that people ask all the time is, are you allowed to exercise before davening? Because let's say a person is concerned about their health, they want to jog or whatever, whatever it would be, and uh, they don't have time during the day. The only time they have is 6 o'clock in the morning or whatever it is before chakras. Now, taking a shower before davening is vadai mutter. And the reason that's vadai mutter is because that is an aspect of honoring God, to be clean, etc. So taking a shower before davening, that's not a problem. But to jog and exercise and do other things, theoretically, would be, would be an issue. But Rosh Shlomo Zalman Orbach actually mattered it for people who could not fit it, fit it into their schedule because he said it's such an important need that sometimes important needs can override the obligations of tefillah. Yeah? Is there any difference or any preference to davening from a sitter versus from a phone? Versus from a, oh, from a phone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's interesting. So generally, uh, let, let's take it a, an earlier question, right? The, the low-tech version of the question would be sitter versus davening by heart. And there are many, many svarim do say that there's some, it's better to daven from a sitter because that could focus you more because when you daven by heart, you're looking around, etc. On the other hand, that may depend on the individual worshiper who may sometimes be able to focus more you know, by closing his eyes or the like. But now we have the new phenomenon of davening from a phone, which of course is not going to work on Shabbos or Yom Tif, uh, but can you daven from a, from a phone? So halachically, I would say that there's no particular um, reason why a phone sitter would not be an adequate sitter, but I do know for various reasons that many Rosh Yeshiva, many Mashkichim, I'm not sure what the Orsameach policy is, if there is a policy, they don't like it. They don't like it, number one, because they regard the phone as either totally treif, depending on what type of phone you have, or at least something that is connected to divrei chol. And they feel that tefillah should be a time in which you want to distance yourself from the paraphernalia that connect you to the week of you know, conversation and the like. So in a sense, they feel that a phone should not be your instrument of tefillah. It should be something that is only used for tefillah and not used for divrei chol or for other things. So, again, I, I don't think this is a halachic consideration. I think it's more of a hashkafa, more of an instinct, more of a sense of propriety and, and derech eretz. So, halachically, there's no problem, but I think a sitter would be better for those particular reasons. Yeah? Um, whenever Mishnah and Pirkei Avot, um, chapter 3, on Mishnah 3, Rabbi Chinnam and Chani says that um, whenever two people are sitting together and they're not engaged in the words of Torah study, um, yeah. it's a session of scoffers. Yes. It comes down very, very, um, very, very hard. And is it, I mean, there's a lot of small talk that goes on. How, like, what exactly, like, how strict do you have to be about this? Because if we take this to the literal level, that pretty much erases, like, all the small talk that we do and makes it very, very difficult just to even be a social human being. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's a good point. Uh, the Mishnah in Pirkei Avos, uh, two people are sitting together. And there is no divrei Torah exchanged between them. By the way, the Mephorshim say, even if each one of them is learning, but they're not interacting in divrei Torah. Right? Not just they're not learning. So that's called Moshav Leitzim. Uh, that's a phrase from Tehillim. An assembly of scoffers uh, who don't care about Ruchnius. Very bad, very bad thing to be. 
So the question becomes, hey, that means you can't schmooze, you can't talk. Well, first of all, like this, the Pirkei Avos doesn't say that the only thing between them is Divrei Torah. It says, if there are people who did not exchange any Divrei Torah in their meal, they're called the Moshe of Leitzim. For example, the Meforshim say that even something like saying, let's bench, may qualify because that's bringing up the mitzvah of Birkat HaMazan. So as a requirement, this is actually very minimal. It's not saying, you know, the whole hour that we're sitting, although that would be a good thing, and it's not a bad, <laughs> certainly would be a good thing, but it's not saying the whole hour we have to speak in Divrei Torah, and if there's one second we're not saying Divrei Torah, that is a Moshe of Leitzim. It's only condemning something in which there is no Torah exchanged at all, while they're sitting. So I don't think that alone would discourage conversation. Now, there are other halachas that may discourage conversation, such as Lashon Hara and, and everything else, which you have to uh, keep in mind. Friendship and social connection are considered to be valuable things in Judaism, meaning the notion that I should spend all of my time learning Torah and, and whatever time I have doesn't mean you can't exchange friendly, halachically permissible conversation. Uh, if a person were to say, I can't talk to anybody because all I do is learn, there would be something wrong with that person. It, it wouldn't be a proper balance of his personality that the Torah requires. Uh, if you see Gedolim, you know, okay, I mean, listen, um, all right, there were Gedolim who talked to never schmooze, okay, but, but, but by and large, you'll find a Gedol will, you know, talk nicely to you, will ask about you, you know, etc. So one has to be aware of not being too obsessive compulsive about this. Uh, OCD is not halachically required. Yeah. Um, so there's a concept of like a shal Milo that like we're gonna be learning like after we die or else, right? I'm just curious, like what are we gonna be learning? Like are we gonna be learning like from the sea? Like I'm guessing now everyone's just gonna be like losing their stuff up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the question is we talk about Yeshiva Shel Maila. There's a yeshiva up, up above, Mesifta de Rakia, it's also, 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 also called. So the question is like, what are you learning there? So the truth is, I, I don't really know, but I'll, I'll tell you uh, what the uh, Hakdama to the Night of Yehuda, the, the famous Shaila Sechuvas of the Night of Yehuda. So the Hakdama was written by the son of Ravi Cheskalando, and uh, he says, that he gave a mushal. He says, imagine a family that was stranded on an island, totally isolated, no books, no schools, no nothing, and they don't know if they'll ever be rescued. So the father thinks he has to at least teach his children how to read, because in case we get rescued, they'll have access to books and the like. So he scratches letters in the sand, and he says, you know, the Aleph is, uh, and then he put vowel signs under it. Aleph with aw is pronounced aw, and ba, and ga, and da. And the kid is spending all of his time learning nonsense syllables. Aw, ba, ga, da, right? Ah, ba, ga, etc. And the kid has no idea why he's doing all this stuff. It makes no sense to him at all, but he does it. And then one day, Baruch Hashem, they get rescued. And then they have svarim, sidurim, chumashim. And everything can now be read because of all of the investment they put. The Nehdi Behuda says, Eilam Hazeh is like an abandoned island. We learn a lot of stuff, but we don't really understand what we're learning. In Olam Haba, all of the ah, ba, ga, da that you did in this world, you will understand at the highest, highest level. So essentially, you'll be learning Rav Metziah, but it'll be a certain level that is beyond your ability to comprehend in this world. So the interesting lesson is this. The only things you will learn in Eilam Haba are the things that you learned in Eilam Hazeh. Those parts of Torah that you never learned in Eilam Hazeh, you will not learn in Eilam Haba, which is a part, of, part of it that may be an argument for programs like Dafyomi, where you kind of cover all of the Talmud, because at least I, people say, well, it's superficial. I don't really know it. But the point is, if my eyes read it once, then it's going to be in my Olam Haba account, like a certain multiple. I'll, I'll make up a number. The multiple is, you will understand things that you learned in this world a million times better. So the more I understand in this world, the more a million times it's going to be. 
but something that I didn't learn in this world at all, I'm not going to have any connection to. So essentially, it's a type of learning which will intensify uh, to the greatest degree uh, all of the work that you put into in Olam Hazza. Yeah. Um, at the risk of sounding overly broad, um, what do you think are some of the biggest problems facing Jewry in the world today, uh, whether that's things like uh, intermarriage, education, uh, other things like that? And are there things that we can do as we kind of go out and <coughs> Yeah, the issue is uh, State of the Union. Uh, what are the major problems of the Jewish world uh, today? And what uh, can we do to try to alleviate those problems? You know, I, I can't say that I have, you know, a global prescription, but, you know, intermarriage, abs not so much in Eretz Israel because whatever, although we have a little bit of a problem even here, but in the United States and other westernized countries, uh, intermarriage is absolutely horrendous. In many parts of the United States, it is seven out of 10 marriages with a Jew is uh, with a guy. The other one is a non-Jew. That is horrendous, 70%. Uh, I think in Jewish history, there has never been an intermarriage rate that was even close. Uh, close to that. And the problem with intermarriage is not only the sin of intermarriage, but what basically happens is that through intermarriage, a family gets totally disconnected from Judaism. If the woman is not Jewish, for sure the kids are not Jewish. That's the end of it. But even if it's the woman is Jewish, the, the kids are basically lost. Baruch Hashem, sometimes they come back. We, you know, we have in our Sameach, we have many, many uh, kids who are products of intermarriage who come back to Judaism. But as grateful as we are for that phenomenon, that is a small, small minority of intermarriage. So intermarriage is a tremendous problem. A lack of Jewish education, which is the cause of intermarriage, primarily, is uh, the, other, uh, the other problem. Uh, those are problems in the Jewish community as a whole. And that creates an obligation on people to engage in outreach and kiruv in all of its various manifestations. Baruch Hashem, Jewish outreach has many, many successes, but it actually is a drop in the bucket uh, in terms of the percentage of people that are being reached. Now, within the religious world, there are also some very serious problems within the religious world. Among them are divisiveness, polarization, lack of avas Yisrael, not connecting to each other, and I will tell you a new phenomenon. Maybe I shouldn't even talk about this. No, you ask a question, I'll talk about it. But I, I, I really would rather not talk about it. I call it the mir apikoris. Uh, we have a new type of problem that is existing in the yeshiva world. And that is people who were even born from, you know, they were FFBs, born from, gone to yeshiva all their life. And they go from day school to yeshiva high school to yeshiva gedola. They're in Mir. They get married. They have kids. And they decide at 28 or 35 that they no longer believe. What's the proof any of this is true? Now, you would think that this would be a very, very rare thing. And, you know, it's still relatively rare. But, like, at least once a week. I got somebody, I, I don't mean to malign Mir in particular, but I, I use it just as an expression of people who are in the yeshiva world who stop believing. Or at least they demand some proof. What on earth is going on? The Mir Apikoris. Okay, I apologize to Mir. Uh, the, although some of them are from Mir. Uh, the Mir Apikoris. What, what is going on? And part of it is that uh, in our Jewish educational system, I'm talking about our firm system. We have been very weak in teaching the foundations of Jewish faith. So there are people who started learning Gemara at sixth grade and they could do Rashi and Tosos and all sorts of things, but they've never gone through, you know, what are the rational arguments for God or for Torah and for everything else. So what is interesting is that you guys in Or Sameach are sometimes getting something that mainstream Orthodox kids don't always get. And that is, uh, you get a background, uh, at least from some of the teachers, in some of the philosophical foundations of Judaism. Now, the argument always was, well, if you're from from birth, you don't need that stuff. You know, you need that stuff if you're coming from college campuses, but a from kid doesn't need that stuff. Well, I don't know. 
I used to think that was true, kind of. But I'm not really sure now. I'm meeting too many mere epicorsum. And part of the problem is, well, there are two problems with it. Part of it is emotional issues. Uh, because in orthodox environments, when kids raise questions that are routinely discussed here, they're told, don't be in a shagitz, you're not picorous. So what happens is somebody feels that they're not being accepted and their questions are not being listened to. They're going to gravitate elsewhere. So, you know, maybe I'm over-exaggerating the problem, but the problem is it hits me all the time. So it's very fresh in my consciousness. So that's a real problem within the Orthodox world, that we have to work on how to uh, answer questions, how to deal with the foundations of emuna. Now, again, I've pointed out, Rabbi Gottlieb points out, Rabbi Tatz points out, I mean, every, I mean, all of us are on the same page here, that when people demand mathematical certainty, mathematical proof for the foundations of emuna, uh, that is not a fair question. And indeed, when Kirov organizations make the claim that they can prove things 100%, they are guilty of false advertising. And in some ways it's catastrophic because when you set the bar so absolutely high, when you're not going to be able to meet that, the person's going to say, oh, the whole system is false. So the real way we have to approach it is that emuna does, is based on rationality. Judaism is a rational system. It's a logical system, and the probabilities are in its favor, Baruch Hashem. But they're still good. So it's not like blind faith jumping off a roof. But just because it's not blind faith doesn't mean there, has, there isn't a leap of faith once you have the rational structure and probabilities. So uh, I do actually blame, I don't want to blame, maybe it's not the right word, um, certain types of, of Kirov approaches that kind of say, like a salesman, you know, 100%, you know, you cannot deny the reality of something. You know, nothing's 100% really. I mean, there are truths that are absolute, but in terms of proving them, God did not design a system that's 100% provable for a very simple reason. If the system would be 100% provable, there would not be free will in operation. And there has to be a system where you could theoretically deny God because then you have to make a choice, you see? So by definition, we live in a world of concealment. We live in a world of obscurity. But again, as I say, the mir arpikoros, again, forgive me for, for, for the, uh, I should ask mirs mechila, but I like the phrase, it kind of, it, it, it kind of encapsulates the situation, uh, is a real, real problem within the Orthodox world. And I, have not, I did not notice it until like the past five years. And I got an email today from somebody in Cleveland who works in Kirov. And he said in the past month, he got a call from eight FFB parents whose kids are in yeshivas. Eight, eight parents in one month that say our children kind of are struggling with emuna issues. So that I think is a major problem we have to work on. Yeah. Uh, here's a send-in. What's worse, smoking a cigarette or using open internet for an equivalent period of time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, the question is, uh, you have uh, 10 minutes to kill. <laughs> so should I smoke or watch internet? Now, again, I, it really depends on the question. If, if you're simply asking me unfiltered, okay, internet without a filter, that, but that, what am I doing without a filter? I still might be doing something innocuous. Are you referring to things that would normally be filtered out? Is that, that the question? Uh, it you doesn't know, specify. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's very hard to say. One, of course, is hurting the goof. Cigarettes are not good for your health. The other could be hurting your neshama. Now, it's true, you're not supposed to hurt your goof, and you're not supposed to hurt your neshama. 100%. We have a mitzvah to take care of our health. But on the other hand, if you have to choose between the guf and the neshama, uh, I think the neshama has to be given priority. So it's the lesser of two evils, but uh, don't fool around with your neshama uh, because that's the most precious, important thing uh, that you have. It's also the case that um, you know, a single cigarette is not going to hurt you, but, but I understand that there's a cumulative effect over time. So it would also depend on frequency. That would be an issue, an issue as well. Yeah. 
Here's a sign. Then, <clears throat> I know Kavod HaTorah is Docha Talmud Torah, example, Leviah of Agadol. But what else in this general, is in this general category of Kavod HaTorah? HaKnaksa is Ksefer Torah, Hanukkah Sabayis of Yeshiva, Adirei Torah event, any smaller event? Yeah, so the question is, uh, normally we take learning extremely seriously and we don't simply mavat el Torah for this or for that or for that, but uh, to give public expression to the honor of Torah, uh, we sometimes set aside actual learning, such as going to the Levaya of Agadol and the like. So the question becomes, how far do you take it? Hachnasa uh, Sefer Torah, they completed a Sefer Torah, various other events, opening of a cheder or opening of a yeshiva, dedication ceremony, uh, and, uh, and the like. So the truth of the matter is, normally one should be very, very strict about this. And in fact, I think I said the other day, in the name of the Nitziv, that even going to the Levaya of a Gadol is technically obligatory only when it's actually passing by where you're learning. You don't have to go out of town. Although the Minog apparently is not like the Nitziv in that, in that way. Normally, one should uh, not overindulge in activities, the kavod the Torah, because the greatest kavod you give to the Torah is learning it. That is the true kavod ha Torah. So I would not necessarily encourage going to uh, openings of yeshivos or, um, or sachnasa sefer Torah, unless you know, you're not learning anyway. So if my choice is, uh, should I go out for pizza or to hachnasa sefer Torah? Yeah, go to hachnasa sefer Torah. But if it's mamish going to cause you to be mavatal Torah, it's not Kedai. In fact, uh, they tell a story about the Chazanish. It's not, not a particularly unusual story, but I think it illustrates the point that the Chazanish was uh, a sandik at a bris, and there were some Talmidim from Panovich that were there at the bris, and they gave him shalom, and he was very harsh with them. He says, what are you doing here? Why are you here? Meaning, he felt that, well, you have to go to every bris, you know, uh, you sit and you learn. Yeah, going to a bris is a mitzvah, but it's not a mitzvah that's greater than Talmud, Talmud Torah. Now, there is another side of the coin that's very interesting, though. The halacha is that you are mevatal Torah, you're mechoyev, for a mitzvah that nobody else can do, that only you can do. Okay? For, so, for example, um, if your parents need you to do something, and it's a special thing that, that if you do it, it means something to them. If somebody else does it, it doesn't have that meaning. So the halacha would be, you would be mavatal Torah in such a situation. Uh, so there are mitzvahs. So going to a wedding would be an example. People always ask the question, well, um, should I go to every, there's Baruch Hashem, there are so many chasnas, you know. Should I go to every chasna if I'm going to miss my morning seder or my night, or my night seder usually and the like. So if Yaakov was very, if Yaakov Kamineski was very critical of Yeshiva Bachrim, of course this was in New York, who were going to chasnas all the time. In fact, he said, uh, he, you know, it says in Pirkei Avos, this is a great uh, word, Ein ben chorin No man is free unless they learn Torah. So Rav Yaakov said, that's the pshat. When you have a job, you can't simply take off from your job every time to go to a wedding. But if you're learning, you can take off for anything. So he says, that's the pshat. No one is free unless they're sitting and learning, because then you're free to do whatever you want. He was saying it sarcastically uh, in, that, uh, in that way. Um, so, generally speaking, should I go to a wedding uh, if I'm going to be Mavatal Torah? The answer is no, you shouldn't. And again, the Nitziv says, the mitzvah that you have to be Mavatal Torah for Achnas Eskala is only if they're walking right by you. However, when you are a special friend, and your absence is going to make the chasen or the kala very sad, and your presence is going to give them exceptional happiness, that becomes a mitzvah that nobody else can do. And at that point, you go. You see? Uh, are you just a regular guy, another guy, or are you somebody very special to that couple? And similarly, the other way around, if the wedding is going to be very, very small, so by your not going, there will be a diminishment in the simcha. So that is also a shikl, right? So the two situations where you go to a wedding, even if you're going to be mavatal Torah, is number one, when you have a special relationship 
with the chasen or the kala. And number two, when there won't be that many people there, and therefore, by definition, your being there is something special. But Stamazai, to go to a wedding, I mean, I, I see guys here, you know, they're so excited. They're going to go to America for this for person's wedding and this person. I mean, they barely know the person or, uh, sometimes, you know, but they're so excited for some excuse to kind of go to a wedding, you know. Um, and, you know, you have to take it seriously because uh, Bittel Torah is a very, very significant point. And sometimes you're mechuyev to be mevatel Torah, but other times it's actually forbidden to be mevatel Torah. Uh, yeah? Could you explain Moshe Feinstein's basis for saying that each of um, Eretz Yisrael is Shumas instead of Shumas? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. This is one of the things I get in trouble with because, I guess, um, okay, a little, little background. There is a machlokas, Rambam and Ramban, regarding the mitzvah of Yishuv Eretz Yisrael living in the land of Israel. Ramban says Beferish. Ramban, Nachmanides, that Yishuv Eretz Yisrael is a positive commandment in the Torah, even today when there's no Beis HaMikdash and no Melech. And this is Mitzvah de Oraisa of Yishuv Eretz Yisrael. Now, what the Rambam's position is, is not so clear. The, the only thing I could say is, he doesn't count Yishuv Eretz Yisrael in the list of the 613. So there's actually a debate. Does he mean it's not a mitzvah? Or it is a mitzvah, but it's counted under some other category? But the, that's a machlokas itself, what the Rambam shita is. But by and large, the conventional understanding of the Rambam is there is no mitzvah of living in Eretz Yisrael. It's a good thing, spiritual, but there's no mitzvah. So Ramban says, Beferish, there's a mitzvah. Rambam says, by implication, let us say, there is no mitzvah. Okay. So you might think that any heter to live outside of Eretz Yisrael is only because you're following the Rambam, but according to Ramban, you got to go. So Rav Moshe uh, Feinstein writes in a tshuva that even according to Ramban, who calls it a mitzvah, it is not an obligatory mitzvah. There are two types of mitzvahs. There is a mitzvah you must do. I must recite Shema. I must wear tefillin. But then there's something called a mitzvah. I'm just elaborating on your question. There's something called a mitzvah kiyumas, meaning you're not obligated to do it, but if you do it, there's a mitzvah. That tefillin is chiyumas. I am obligated to put on tefillin. Tzitzis is kiyumas, because if I wear a four-cornered garment, then I have to have tzitzis, but I don't have to wear the garment. Shechita, in a sense, may be called kiyumis. If I shecht, I'm doing a mitzvah, but I don't have to go out and shecht. I don't have to eat meat. So Rav Moshe says, when the Ramban says Yishuv Eretz Yisrael is a mitzvah, he just means if you move here and if you live here, you get a mitzvah, but you're not obligated. That it's kiyumis, not chiyumis. So, I, so I've already said, again, again, I mean... Um, I am not at all being modest in any way to say that I am far, 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 far worse than dirt under Rav Moshe's toes. I mean, there's no, <laughs> that's, that's not false modesty by any, any means at all. Uh, but but I, I, th I think I did point out that Rav Moshe's uh, Chiddush is very, very difficult to fit into the actual words of the Ramban. The Ramban's words appear in Sefer HaMitzvahs. In other words, after the Rambam listed the mitzvahs, the Ramban gave his list of extra mitzvahs that he added. Of course, keep in mind, this is a zero-sum game. Since you're bound to the number 613, every time Ramban added something, you had to take something out. Oh, okay, the Ramban's figured it out, um, what to do. Uh, but in the Ramban's language, I believe, you will, you, Imamish has the words, chayav, chiyuv, obligated. So I, I agree with you. I, I don't really have an answer uh, how you could interpret the Ramban as mitzvah kiyumas. Now, now, certainly what, it, what you can say, and this is for sure, is that even the Ramban would admit there are exceptions to the obligation. So to learn Torah, to find a wife, to make a parnasa. So I don't mean chiyuvis means every single person absolutely has to come. 
So that, that much is true. And may, maybe that's what Rav Moshe means, although the Lushan is not mashma. But at least for people who don't have the reason not to come, it seems to be mamash a e, chiyav. E so Rav Moshe's characterization, again, lani estaitin, again, offerani tachtav, is a tzorich in godom, mamash. Uh, no hate mail, please. Uh, yeah. Um, when Gedolim think about, like, think about Limud Torah, when they're continuing to learn Torah in their head while doing other mitzvos, why is that not considered doing mitzvos in bundles? Yeah, that's that's an, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Uh, there is a klal in the Gemara that you try not to bundle up on mitzvos uh, because each mitzvah should have its own time and place. The example would be that uh, on a cup of wine, uh, you don't recite uh, multiple mitzvahs, meaning uh, when you uh, bench on a cup, you know, you don't use that cup for, you know, the cup of wine that you use for kiddish, you don't use for benching and, and the like. No, the wine, I don't mean the physical cup. Uh, you don't do mitzvahs, chavilos, chavilos. Uh, and that's because every mitzvah deserves its own kavod. So the question becomes, uh, Gedolim commonly will be thinking of Torah learning while they're doing some other mitzvah, like putting schach on the sukkah. Now, I don't mean during davening, they shouldn't. During davening, Taka, they shouldn't think of Torah learning. But I gave an example, I'm, I'm putting schach on the sukkah, so I'll be thinking of learning, or whatever it would be. So the question becomes, why isn't that a problem of uh, not doubling up on, 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 on mitzvahs? I think the difference is that the idea of not doubling up is only when you can do the mitzvah sequentially, meaning why double up? I'll do this mitzvah, then I'll do that mitzvah. With Talmud Torah, because Talmud Torah is a 24-7 mitzvah, you can never really say, well, I don't think in learning now, I'll think about learning later. No, because you're high of now and later. So when it's a mitzvah that's not limited to a particular time, then there's no problem with bundling it up simply because any second you lose cannot be made up. You can't make up lost Torah learning, in a sense, because, um, you know, I'm, I'm high of all the time. So, so even if I do that time, I didn't make up this time, right? So that's why I think there wouldn't be the problem of chavilos, chavilos. Yeah? Um, how, how does learning from a, a goy work, and especially when you should go, I mean, everyone has limited time, so how much time should we allocate to learning secular, not, not specifically how much time to allocate, but what, what should be the thought process when thinking to learn something secular versus learning for us? Now you're talking about secular like by going to college or just on your own to read, read books? Uh, either. Okay. okay. Yeah, so it's interesting. There, there are different opinions on this. You know, the Gemara has a story that um, someone asked his uncle, uh, I think it was Rabbi Ishmael, like, um, when can I learn like secular wisdom? So he said, oh, I'll give you exactly. Find a time that's not night and not day, and you can learn it then, because the Torah is Vagisa Vayoma Balaila. You think about the Torah day and night. So any time that's not day and night, mm, that's interesting. So you might think, hmm, isn't that Bein Hashmashos? <laughs> no, it's not. Bein Hashmashos is a Suffolk day or Suffolk night. <laughs> so it's either day or night, or maybe it changes in the middle. So that's not going to help you. Even Bein Hashmashos is not going to help you, because that's not a not day and not and not and not night. So there was an idea that, or there is an idea that, you know, there's no room at all for secular wisdom. And yet the Ramah brings, the Ramah himself brings uh, in the Shulchan Aruch that a person is permitted to make some time bayakroy on a temporary basis to augment his Torah knowledge with secular wisdom like science, mathematics, history, uh, or the like on the grounds <laughs> that this will deepen his understanding of the Torah itself. In fact, there's a passage from the Vilna Gaon in the controversial Sefer Kol HaTor, which some people say was a forgery, but, but, but Chaim Friedlander checked it out and he said it was authentic. The Vilna Gaon said, for every measure of secular wisdom you don't possess, you are deficient in 10 times that amount of Torah that you don't understand. So, and the Rambam also describes it. The Rambam describes, the Rambam, of course, was very big in secular wisdom. Besides medicine, the Rambam was math mathematics, uh, the science of the time, which was largely Aristotelian, but the Rambam was thoroughly familiar 
with all of the science of his time, the Rambam describes his connection to those sciences. They were rakochot v'tabachot. Basically, they were kitchen workers. They were cooks, meaning they were secondary to prepare the food so I could understand the Torah in a better way. So the question becomes, and of course, the Vilna Gaon himself commissioned it. You can actually probably get this in Hebrew books for free. He commissioned one of his Talmidim to do an English translate, I'm, I'm sorry, Hebrew translation of Euclid's geometry. The elements of Euclid translated in Hebrew. Ayo Meshulash. And that's Euclid. And this was P. the Vilna Gaon's directive. So there is Vadai a role in secular wisdom for at least two reasons. Number one, it can help you in Parnassa. That's the basic idea. Get a job. But number two, it can help you have a deeper understanding of Torah and life by looking at the wisdom of the world. So the question then becomes, okay, there's room for it. The Ramah permits it. Uh, how much time? That's going to be a big, uh, that's going to be a big issue. It, it's, hard, it's hard for me to say. I think it depends on the person. It depends on how much of your time you're able to learn. Uh, sometimes a person needs a break, and this might be a useful break because you're using even your breaks for chachma and, and, and the like. But generally speaking, if I had to pull a number out of my pocket, I would say between an hour and an hour and a half is considered to be a legitimate akroi within the definition of the Ramah. My own Rosh Hashiva, Rav Yaakov Weinberg, is Rav Noach's brother, Zichron Olivracha, uh, claims that the school system, the secular school system, whether it's high school or college, was so inefficient that uh, on your own, you could learn in one hour what it would take a semester to kind of teach you in a college course. So he says that uh, one hour a day, you can have quite a good education. Uh, maybe it's not intrinsically good, but as good as you would get in the whole four years of four years of college. Yeah. Um, we know that in um, Mishnah, okay. for example, or in various other texts, but specifically Mishnah, that there are different your start, there are different textual variants, and yep. these resulted um, um, because of a mistake that scribe made over over the generations. Is there any holiness to um, the Gersaot that? We recite every day, and let's say Perkei Avot, and we just we don't know which is the, the real Girsa, is there holiness, and also from a Kabbalistic perspective, what, when we're saying that something like word letter by letter came from Moses, Moshe from Sinai, how exactly does that work when it's just a mere scribe's um, mistake? Right, right, right. So the issue is scribal error, different nusach, different texts. And these mistakes got introduced by transmission mistakes. Uh, so let me just address the second point. The notion of every word came from Sinai is not true when it comes to the Mishnah and the Gemara. God may have given the rules and the principles, but the actual textual formulations are not from Moshe B. Sinai. They are man-made, so that's not the problem. Your problem on that would exist if we had those differences in the Torah, you know, the written five books of Moses. Okay, but in terms of Kedusha, is there Kedusha when you're learning what might be a mistake. Right, I'm learning a mistaken text. Now, I don't know if it's mistaken because I'm not sure if this is mistaken or that's mistaken. So, first of all, like this. A lot of mistakes don't even change the meaning. Right, so that's not a problem. Right, uh, But let's talk about the worst case scenario where the mistakes are radically different meanings and one of them is just a mistake. The truth is there's still Kedusha. And the reason there's Kedusha is that God sanctifies the human effort of the Jewish people to try to understand his will. And even when we're making mistakes, we are learning Torah, trying to understand his will. And I'll prove it to you from other situations. You're talking about a mistake in Gersa. But let's look at the Gemara itself. A lot of the Gemara are Hava Aminas. Hava aminas, meaning we thought this. And then we go and we prove that that's wrong. So, okay, all of that is wrong, and this is the way we go. Well, I spent an hour, an hour and a half, going over something that the Gemara is going to tell me is wrong. Did I waste my hour and a half? Uh, 
Was my birchas, and let's assume I didn't get to the maskan until the next day, was my birchas atorah levatala that morning? The answer is no. Even the mistakes are part of Torah because they are part of your effort to understand the will of Hashem. So a person shouldn't feel bad. If I worked and I worked and I worked, barking up the wrong tree or going down the wrong road, because that is part of my connection to Hashem's Torah, even my mistakes. So that's what I would say to that. Yeah. Um, back to the question before that. Um, did, did your law education help you with uh, your Torah study? And if so, I'm just curious how. Yeah, so a personal question. Uh, did, my <laughs> did my legal education help with, uh, with, with uh, learning, Jewish learning? Uh, the answer is 100% it did. The question is whether the cost justifies no, the benefit. Meaning, if you ask me, are there benefits to a secular education in certain fields? In terms of learning, there is no question. Uh, because, number one, uh, law school gave me a sense of how to organize things in a better way, which helps a lot in learning, a sense of how to address certain issues. I often found in legal education that when certain transactions were described, a light bulb went on. Oh, that's what the Gemara and Bava Metziah meant, because you described it in a modern way. Right? You know, when you're describing a transaction, the way it occurred, let's say, you know, 1,500 years ago, you don't really know, but then you see there's a modern a analogy. So there's no question that, um, let's say, a legal education can very much help you in learning. Uh, the question becomes, though, that there's a lot of costs, the amount of time you're taking away from learning. So the issue of secular education is not so much, oh, it's bad, it's destructive, it's evil, it's stupid, it's worthless, although sometimes it is. But the issue is not so much that. The issue are trade-offs and balances. Yes, there are benefits. Yes, there are valuable things you can get. But in the course of those benefits, there are things you're giving up. So the real question of chesh ben nefesh that a person has to go through is, am I giving up more than I'm getting? And that, that's where you get into the question. Right? So the rhetoric that all of it is worthless, that I think is overstated. But the cost-benefit calculus in life is a real question. Now, I've mentioned a million times, I'll mention a million and one, my conversation with Rav Yaakov Karneski before I went to law school. And Rav Yaakov Karneski did not want to tell me one way or the other. He wanted me to decide which is a very interesting model for how a gadol uh, gives etzah. But the one thing Rav Yaakov told me is that whatever you do, you have to use it for avodah Hashem. And that's the one thing that he said, that, you know, you do this, you do that, you're kolel, you're rascal, you got to find a way to fold it in to your service to HaKadosh Baruch Yeah. Um, one thing I mentioned in the Chumash is that uh, we talk about, you know, the firstborn has certain privileges, certain rights, um, but just... When I looked at the Chumash, it seems like the firstborn is repeatedly falling short. You know, Moshe <laughs> should have Aaron, Kain and Avel, uh, Esav and Yaakov, uh, Ephraim and Menashe. It yeah. seems like there's, there's an imbalance there. What is, what is the reason? For yeah, that? this is 100% correct that uh, the whole story of Bracious, and you're right, even Moshe and Aaron is, is an example carrying over after the Torah, is the notion of the younger usurping the role of the older, uh, the younger taking over, Yitzchak takes over Yishmael, Yaakov takes over Esav, uh, Yosef rules over his brothers, Ephraim and, Men Ephraim and Menashe, Ephraim is the younger brother, rules over Menashe. So the Tyrus seems to be what you might call in a cognitive dissonant state, meaning to say on one hand, we talk about the Bukhor, the firstborn, the double portion. Uh, originally, before the Chedo Ego, the Bukhor was supposed to do the service in the Mishkan and later the Beis HaMikdash, right? The, the only reason the Bukharis got disqualified and Shevet Levi was chosen is only because of the sin of the Ego. Otherwise, the Avaidah would have been done with the Bukhara of the family. So I think the Torah is, does, is teaching us a lesson, meaning intrinsically, a Bukhara does have a certain status and a certain Cheshivas. But the Torah also wants to teach me that ultimately what you do with your life is more important than the status into which you were born. Yeah, Bukhor is born into a privileged status. That is true. But the Torah wants to teach me that what really counts in life is what you do, not what you are. 
right? You are this, you are. In fact, even with a Jew that way. You know, yeah, I'm a Jew, right? So what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to walk around just telling people, you know, telling a guy, I'm, you know, I'm better than you, I'm a Jew. Well, no. You know, if a Jew doesn't <laughs> live the way he's supposed to live, he's not better than the guy. You know, he might be worse than the guy, right? So you've got to take your status and turn it into something meaningful by virtue of the way, of the way you live. I remember, I still remember this when I was in ninth grade in high school. So uh, there was a particular guy, he was a senior, and you know, senior, this is an issue. Seniors had the senior lounge and everything else, you know. And this, oh, this, the only thing this guy had was he was a senior. So like, you know, you walked into, hey, we're a senior, freshman, get out of here, you know. You know it was a, I'm a senior. Like, <laughs> but there was, no, uh, there was no accomplishment behind that, behind that at all. And that's kind of the, I'm a bachor. You know, okay, you're a bachor, so what, you know. What have you done with that status? Yeah. So, um, um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, there, so there are a lot of there are some shows nowadays that um, disparage the the Haredi or the ultra orthodox lifestyle, um, and I mean obviously they're not uh, the, the people who made those shows are not serious about looking into the issues in the Haredi community. They just want to kind of. Make Jews look bad, yep. but um, a lot of people who are well-meaning watch those shows and think that that is the actual way that Jewish communities are run. So my question basically is: when somebody, when a well, when a well-intentioned but uninformed person asks a question about that show or w one of those shows, then what's the best way to respond to them? Yeah, th this is very, very difficult. Uh, you're correct. Uh, in the media, there's a lot of, um, or not a lot, but a number of shows that uh, try to portray the uh, religious world, the, the from world. Uh, once in a while, they're positive. There are some positive things, but a lot of it is very, very uh, negative. And unfortunately, because these shows get a lot of dissemination, people who are not malicious, but they will form their understanding of Torah Judaism through these very negative, distorted portrayals. So the question is, what do you do? So I'll tell you one thing that's interesting. The first thing you've got to do is, you know, acknowledge that there may be shortcomings. Yeah, that's an important point, you know, uh, because people often come with an attack, and our instinct is to defend no matter what. Sometimes, you know, you could say, you know, there is a point here. But the point is not a complete point, and you need to balance it. I'll call that moda bemixas. Partial admission, actually even rhetorically, is a great way to disempower your antagonist. Uh, meaning, I mean, I remember I, I, I once actually had a debate myself with uh, Alan Dershowitz, who was, uh, you know, well, he is a famous professor at Harvard uh, and the like. And he came from a from family, and uh, he left, you know, he left it. Although he came, he's become more traditional, actually, over the years. Uh, and he came in. It was at a Chabad event for all that. I, th I think uh, the, the guy who invited him got in big trouble with the Chabad superiors. He, invi he invited Dershowitz because of celebrity. But then Dershowitz started like attacking, like, from life. And I remember the older Chabad guys were looking at the, the uh, organizer of the event, like, you know, so <laughs> whatever. So Dershowitz started attacking this and attacking that. And he says, I'm not like you people. I think through things. I look at the Talmud too, but I, you know, I have independent judgment. And he had a whole bunch of things. So I had to talk. I was a last minute, but I, I was not the des I, I was a last minute substitute for somebody else who couldn't make it. I think Dershowitz, was, I think Dershowitz was, was offended at that because I wasn't you know, famous or anything. The other guy was, was famous. Like, what is this? So he was very resentful, even his body language. You know, his arms were together. You know. And I started saying, you know, I agree with Professor Dershowitz in like, you know, 30% of what he said. I agree we have this problem and that problem and that problem. We got to work on it. All of a sudden, you could see his body language started softening. He started, you know, and he got very, very interested. And... Afterwards, he started saying, but you know, there's a lot of good stuff about from people, too. And he started talking about the good thing. Meaning, instead of kind of trying to say, totally wrong, acknowledge. We do have problems. Acknowledge it. But say, but there's a much larger picture that you've got to look at. And if you understand the whole picture, you'll see the beauty and you'll see the goodness. Okay? So this is a, a, actually a hint. In Israel, we don't do that. In Israel, whenever we debate anything, it's like, you know, if you... 
if you say something different than me, you're an idiot or a Moloch or something. So in other words, everything is 100%. You know, I'm 100% right and you're 100% wrong, no matter what the issue is. But instead of my saying, I'm 100% right and you're 100% wrong, what if I say, you know, there's some truth to what you're saying. You're going to see that person's going to totally change the way he's going to be miyachas to your arguments at that point. So that, that's what I think you have to do. Yeah? What is the iser if there is an iser when someone says a certain action on Shabbos is not a Shabbos thing? Yeah, so, uh, right, this is, uh, we often say when we don't know any particular halacha, we say it's not Shabbos stick. What is, what is this, uh, what is the idea? So first of all, there are, the halachas are complicated, but there are halachos about what you're allowed to talk about and not talk about on Shabbos, meaning there are halachos besides the 39 malachos. Your speech shouldn't be about business, shouldn't be about commerce, shouldn't be about future plans that involve Chilu Shabbos. So some of not Shabbistic is connected to improper speech, which is actually part of the halacha. But then there is another concept. So that's a halachic, not Shabbistic. But then I think there's a non-halachic, non-Shabbistic idea. Meaning even if something is not a technical violation of halacha, the question is, why did Hashem give us a Shabbos? How does he want us to spend a Shabbos? I mean, let's take an example of basketball, right? In the States, this is a very big issue in the modern Orthodox community. Can you play basketball on Shabbos, right? I got a hoop in my, uh, you know, side of my garage. You know, so you'll find uh, you know, modern Orthodox kids will sometimes spend uh, the whole afternoon, particularly a long job, playing basketball. Now, is it usher to play basketball on Shabbos? Technically, probably not, at least if it's not on a dirt court. If it's on the dirt, you know, that's one thing. But on a clay court or a paved asphalt driveway, there's no issue. Show me in the Shulchan Aruch where you're, where you're not allowed to play ball. Not there. So is it or the old idea of putting the TV on a timer? Now they have much more modern, sophisticated ways. But when I was growing up, you know, could you put the TV on a timer and watch TV on Shabbos? So a lot of these things might be technically OK. But is that the end of it? Is that the end of the story? Is this why Hashem gave us Shabbos? Is this what Shabbos is supposed to do for us? Now, I'll admit, if a kid is going out of his head, because Shabbos afternoon is uh, eight hours long, or whatever, whatever it would be, and they need to play basketball for an hour, there's a muckum there. If that will put them in a frame of mind where they can learn or do something spiritual, yeah, that's OK. But to simply say, I'm going to spend all of Shabbos afternoon playing basketball, you have a problem that it's not Shabbistic. Is it Osir? Technically, it's not Osir. But is it why Hashem gave us Shabbos? It isn't. And that's an important part of being sensitive to the spiritual meaning of things beyond the technical halacha. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I do have, have to run. But OK, I'm sorry, I apologize for uh, cutting it short. Um, after I told you uh, not to go to a chasna for Bittel Torah, I'm, I'm a little bit of a hypocrite, but I, but I, <laughs> <laughs> but I have. I <laughs> need it there. Okay, take care. Thank you.